All right, so there we go. Maybe one more from 11.6. Let's do that. So remember we had the two kinds that were going on in 11.6, right? In 11.6, no, so I put off the due date. It's not due till after Easter break. Uh, number one through four, you had to do substitution. Substitution. It's all the T's in there. Substitution because they were not like terms. Remember that? And then 11, 6, number 5 through 8, you use the addition method. Addition method because they are like terms. You with me? You remember that? And then 9 and 10 were calculated. So you basically look at them and you say, hey, are these things like terms? Are they like terms? Yeah, x squared with x squared, y squared with y squared, numbers with numbers, yeah. Those are like terms. Whereas some of the other ones, numbers 1 through 4, they would have like 7x squared plus 3xy plus 2, that's a 2, 2y. You know, and the bottom would be, would be 4x squared plus 7x or something equals 11 equals or whatever, you know, then they'd go like, this doesn't match that, this has a Y, that doesn't, right, they'd have unlike terms, right, that was numbers one through four, they had unlike terms, so we could not do the addition method, addition methods only when they're, they can be added, and you can only add like terms, right, so addition method's easier, so whenever you've got like terms, just go ahead and do the addition method, so that's this one, right, so we'll just do the addition method on this one. So I'll just grab that negative 1 and jump it over. So we'll have 7x squared minus 3y squared equals 1. 8x squared plus 8y squared equals 4, right? And then you can just do the addition method. I have to them up. X squareds over x squareds, y squareds over y squareds, numbers over numbers. So you can just go ahead now and just do the addition method thing. Do you remember how to do addition method? Got to make opposites somewhere, right? You either got to make the two X's or the two Y's. I'll just do the X's there in the front, whatever. So I got to make these two X's become opposites of each other. So you got to multiply by the other guy. You got to multiply the 8 by 7 and the 7 by 8. And I got to make one of them negative, huh? Do you remember all that from your algebra days? I'm teaching that right now in, in an algebra class I'm teaching. Remember that? So the, I'll put the minus 8 there. Right, they switch. The he goes there and he goes there. Remember that kind of thing? Now, you can do the Y's instead of the X's if you want. It doesn't matter. Just pick one of them and get it out of there. Make them opposites so that when you add them, it's zero. So do that. Multiply through those guys, and you should get some canceling stuff to happen. Let's see if you can get that. I'll come up here and do that. These are very long problems, especially numbers one through four. All right, so what do we got? We got minus 56x squared plus 24y squared is minus 8. The bottom one is 56x squared plus 56y squared equals 28, add them up, bye-bye x squareds, right? See what happened there? Remember that from your algebra days? So you got x squareds to cancel, keep going on the y squareds. Is that going to be, um, is it 80? y squared is 20. That's nice. Divide by 80. y squared, I'm going to go to decimals, 0.2, well, I guess I better, they want fractions, huh? All right, one-fourth. Good, and then throw the roof on the house. Up and down the ladder, y is plus or minus a half. We good to there? Oh, no, they don't say anything about fractions, huh? So I can just do decimals if I want. might be easier. So y is plus or minus, I'll just say 0.5. So y is plus or minus 0.5. So I got y, and now you got to plug back in to get x, right? Where do you plug in? Anywhere you want. Basically, anywhere you want. It, back when we were doing problems number one through four, we always plugged into whichever equation was easier. But these are equally 
the, the one's not easier than the other. They're equal levels. They're like terms. So I'll just plug into the top one. 7x squared minus 3y squared minus 1 equals, equals 0. Plus or minus 0.5. Plug that in for, whoops, for y, huh? Now, do I really need to, here, let, let me write it out. 7x squared minus 3. 0.5 squared minus 1 equals 0. So I just plugged in 0.5 for y. There's going to be no difference between plus and negative 0.5 because it's squared. Does everybody see that? If there, was, if there was y to the first power somewhere, then there would be a difference. But if there's just y squared, if the only y term is y squared, then there's no difference between positive and negative. Does that make sense? So I'll just do it together. So 7x squared minus 3 fourths. Is it 0.75, I think? Yeah. Minus 1 is 0. 7x squared minus 1.75 is 0. I'm totally running out of room, as I always do on these things. You good so far? Everybody see what I'm, what I'm doing? I just plugged in 0.5 for took your first equation, and I'll plug it in 0.5 for y. Down to here, jump the 1.75 over, divide by the 7, and root it. So jump that over. 7x squared is 1.75. Um, bring it up here. So 7x squared is 1.75. Divide by the 7. Let me see. It was 1.25, isn't it? Yeah, nice. Okay, I was hoping it would be nice. It is. And then roof on the house, up and down the ladder. 0.5 plus or minus. So it's the same thing as the y. X came out plus or minus 0.5 also. Are we good? Am I going too fast? You guys look a little shocked. Or maybe you're just interested. I don't know. Is that making sense? Questions I can help with that. Now, what are my final answers? Everybody, everybody see what I did first of all. Maybe I'm going too fast. I know these are messy. Everybody see what I did. So I, I identified them from the beginning. I said, look, they're like terms, aren't they? That's, that's how you know whether you can do the addition method or substitution, right? Number one through four were substitution because they were not like terms. You had different kind of terms, like an x squared and then an xy or something, right? Unlike terms, you've got to do substitution, which means we did that last time. Look back at the old YouTube. You've got to solve for x or solve for y in the easier equation and plug into the harder. But in these ones, these equations, nobody's easier or harder. They're equal level because they're like terms. So if they're like terms, just line them up like I did here and get something to cancel by multiplying by the other guy. And then I solve for y, plug back in, solve for x. So what are my answers then? i got plus or minus... 0.5 for x and y. What does that mean? You know, huh? That means four options for plus or minus 0.5, doesn't it? You know what I mean? It's 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Here's the answers. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, with the four different sign options, right? Both plus, both minus, the first one plus, second minus, first one minus, second one plus. Four different, so I put commas between them, comma, 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 and that's, that's it. Yeah, I think there's a plus, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. So just do that. Now on the test, on the test I'm totally fine. If you wanted to say, look, look, isn't the answer just plus or minus 0.5 comma plus or minus 0.5. Those are my four answers. Yeah, totally good. That's right. And, and I think Samantha might be right. They might allow you to type that in just like that. Questions on that one? We good? All right. I'm going to flash off of that. Make sure I didn't leave you high and dry. 9 and 10 are calculator. So this is a calculator problem. How do you know? It says use the graphing utility, right? So to use the graphing utility, you've got to type into y1 and y2, which means you've got to get y alone, right? So that means take that top equation, 
x squared plus y cubed is 2. Solve for y. So grab the x squared, jump it over. y cubed is 2 minus x squared. Good so far. I'm trying to solve for y. Does that make sense? I'm going to solve both these equations for y and then type them into my graphing calculator and graph them and intersect, right? That's the game plan. So now what do you do to get y alone there? I did it super quick Tuesday. What do you do to get rid of that third power? Cube root or one-third power, either way, same thing. I'll just do one-third power to both sides because that cancels, right? One-third of three is one. It's y to the one or just y. That makes it regular y, doesn't it? Right? Because one-third times three is one. Does that make sense what happened there? One-third power both sides? So there's, there's my y1. And now for the other one, let's do the other one. So we've got x cubed y equals 5. Got to solve for y, so that's pretty easy. Divide by x cubed. So y equals 5 over x cubed. So this will be y1, this will be y2, or vice versa. The order doesn't really matter. Type them into your graphing calculator and hit intersect. Now, it does something kind of weird. Somebody grabbed me after class the other day, and I didn't realize they were right um, that it does something kind of weird. So you might try it. If you have a second with your graphing, your TI or your Casio, type those into Y1 and Y2. Hit the graph button and do the intersecting. Actually, the Casio is nicer. The Casio just nails it out, no problem at all. It's the TI that has a little struggle with it. So type that into Y1, type it into Y2, and graph them. What you'll get is you'll get a graph that basically, I think it, I think it sort of, does it look like that? And then one branch is, well, I can't remember. Does it go down below? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I forget. But all, all I know is one of the branches is over here, I think. Wait, I'm still confused. I th okay, I, th I think it's coming to me now. I think it's like this. I think you get this thing in the middle, and then the other graph is like over here and here. Something like that. And the intersection's way over there. It's on the left side, I remember that. And anyway, when you, when you graph it on your calculator, you've got to, you got to do... Graph, right, and then hit second. So on the on the calculator, on the TI, the Casio does a good job, but the TI struggles. Graph it, hit second cal, go down to intersect, choose that. But then when you do intersect, normally we just hit enter, enter, enter. We don't have to think about it, you know. You can hit enter, enter. That doesn't matter. That's just it, what it's asking you there. It's saying, hey, what's the first graph? What's the second graph? Well, we've only got two graphs. See, it's, it's really made to be used when you have, like, more than two graphs on the screen. You've got three or four or five graphs all intersecting in all different places, and it's asking you, which two graphs do you want me to intersect? Well, we've only got two graphs up there, so those two, calculator, those two, right? So you just hit enter, enter. But the third question, when it asks you the guess, you do have to move around a little bit because the first guess is over on the right side, it's over there moving along the right side, and it'll never find it. If it's on this right branch, it'll never make it over to this left branch and find the actual intersection, which is on the left branch. So you have to move it there manually and let it guess in that region. So you guess you have to move to the left until it's on the left branch, because that's where you can see the answer is, and then click Enter after that. So try that. Anybody got an answer? Also, it goes, oh, that's what it is. Okay, I got it all backwards. Thanks. I was trying to remember it, and I remembered it wrongly. Yeah, that looks right. That looks right. Let me, let me draw it. Um, so it's, it's more like this. Huh? So it's one branch up here and one branch down here. And then the other graph is does this. 
like that. And then here's the intersection over there. Yeah, right. And that looks like what, negative 1.71 or 72, however far they want me to round. Hundreds, okay. So it looks like it's negative 1.72 for x. And y is um, negative 0.98. Negative 0.98, yeah. You guys getting that? Anybody else getting that answer? Not looking good? So that's what you should get. If you have trouble getting that in your calculator, feel free to grab me after class. I would be glad to help. Okay, so there we go. Let's put 11.6 to rest. So there it is, 12.1. It's a, what does that mean when you have 11 with an exclamation point like that? That means 11, and you're just like really excited about it, right? <laughs> no, you guys know you Multiply all the way down, huh? Yeah, it's called, it's called 11 factorial, and it means start at 11, go down by 1 every time, multiply them all together until you get down to 1. Now, you can do that by hand or by calculator. And the TI, anyway, it'll be found under the math feature, the math button on the left side. Hit math, and then go across a few times to the PRB, the probability menu, and then go down, and you'll find the exclamation point button. It's kind of hidden. It's under math. Go over to probability. It's a probability kind of function. You'll find it. So you've got to put the 11 on the screen first. First you put the 11 on the screen. Then you go math over to probability down to the exclamation, and you'll do 11 factorial. And I, what's the answer? Something really big? Three, ooh, that's big. Three, nine, nine, one, 6,800. Thank you, Mr. Terrence. Uh, so 39,916,800. Who would think it would get that big, just starting at 11 and multiplying down to 1? It's like almost 40 million. Bigger than I would have guessed. Good there? Makes sense on that? 11 factorial? Okay, so we have 4 factorial, 10 factorial, over 6 factorial. Now, you can just do it all by calculator if you want. It might save you a little bit of time to simplify. Do you realize 10 factorial and 6 factorial are going to have a bunch of canceling in them? 6 on down is going to cancel out of both of them. It could save you a little time to do a little by hand work first. You don't have to. If you want to just hit all the buttons on the calculator, get all the numbers you could. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some by hand work. 4, 3, 2, 1, that's 4 factorial, right? 10 factorial is 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, over. And then on the bottom, 6 factorial is 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. See what happens? A lot of nice canceling, huh? So you can just use your calculator now and just type in this. Save you a little bit of work, but it's not a big deal. Somebody got a number there? One two zero oh, nine sixty. One twenty thousand nine sixty. Anybody else getting that? Good. Questions? We good? So factorial. All right, so n over n plus 3. So now we're starting sequences, sequence formulas. So they're giving me that formula, n over n plus 3. And basically what they want me to do, see right here they're saying a sub 1. They want me to take that formula, n over n plus 3, and they want me to put in n equals 1. What do you get? 1 over 1 plus 3, which is 1 fourth. And then they want me to take the formula a second time and now put in 2. What do you get? 2 over 2 plus 3, or 2 fifths. So that's, a, that's called a sub 1, a sub 2. Is it making sense what I'm doing there? I'm just taking the formula n over n plus 3, and I'm plugging in 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. I want me to go all the way to 5. They want a1, that's called a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, 
etc. So take n over n plus 3. This time plug in n is 3. And you get 3 over 3 plus 3. 3, 6 or a half. So that's a sub 3. It's a half. It's making sense? Just plug it in. Let's come up here and do n over n plus 3. Plug in n is 4. So then we'll get 4 over 4 plus 3 is 4 sevenths. So that's a sub 4. And finally, last one, n over n plus 3. n is 5. 5 over 5 plus 3. 5 eighths. That's a sub 5. So we're just simply taking that formula, plugging in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And those are the arithmetic sequence numbers, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Good. On that, just plug it in. All right. So, 4 to the n over 4 to the n plus 9. So there's my formula. So start by plugging in n equals 1. Then do 2, 3, 4, and 5. I just want you to go from 1 to 5, plug it in. Four thirteenths is the first one. We good. Let's go to two. So sixteen and twenty five, sixteen twenty fifths is a sub two. Go to 3, 4 to the 3rd over 4 to the 3rd plus 9, what's that, 64 over 64 plus 9, so 4 over 73. Can I go dot, dot, dot? Just do 4 and do 5 and same thing. A lot of flickering in the screen there. Questions on that? We good? Just plugging in the formulas? Okay, so here we go. So now they're giving me a formula. Same thing. Find the first five terms. So the formula this time is 6 over e to the n. e is that special number, right? Like pi is a special number, 3.14, whatever, whatever. The decimal goes on and on. e is a special number, 2.718, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, we're just going to leave it as e. How do we know? Because it says um, exact answer. It means it doesn't want decimals rounded. You know, e goes forever. Like pi. What's that called when a number's decimal goes forever with no pattern? Do you know? What's it called? It's, non, it's more than that. Non-terminating just means doesn't terminate, doesn't end. But I, I specifically said doesn't end and no pattern. So for example, like one-third would be 0.3s forever. That's non-terminating, but that has a pattern. Like one plus three would be one-third plus three. Like one plus three would be one-third plus three. Three plus three would be one-third plus three. Four plus four would be one-third plus three. Five plus five would be one-third plus three. Six plus six would be one-third plus three. Seven plus seven would be one-third plus three. Eight plus eight would be there's no pattern. I don't know if you know that. There's no pattern. They just keep changing up. So what's that called when the number's decimal goes forever, doesn't terminate, and doesn't have a pattern? That number is called weird. No, that's not the name. <laughs> Irrational. I don't know if you ever heard that. Anyway, we're not, we're not testing on that. Irrational. So E and pi are irrational. It means you can't make them a ratio. They can never be written as a fraction, whole number over whole number. Anyway. I'm getting into stuff, number theory. We're not going there. All right. Anyway, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to plug in 1. So just 6 over e to the 1. So just leave it like that. There's nothing you can really do with it. And they don't want me to put in the decimal because the decimal would go forever. I would have to round it, and then I wouldn't be exact. When they say exact, they mean don't round a decimal. So I have to leave it as e, right? See what they mean by that? They mean leave e as e because otherwise you'd have to round the decimal because e goes forever. n equals 2. 6 over e squared, n equals 3. There's not much to this, huh? 6 over e to the third, you got it. That's all we're doing. 
good on that? E is a special number. You'll see why in calculus. All right, are you all feeling tricky today? Did you wake up thinking, I feel tricky today? No, that'd be weird. All right, so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to work backwards. We're going we're gonna to say, okay, there's the, you know, we've been, they've been giving us a formula, the last four problems or whatever, they gave us a formula, we plugged in one, two, three, four, five, and cranked out terms, right? Now we're going backwards. They're saying, hey, there's some formula, we plugged in one and we got four. Then we plugged in two and we got negative eight. Then we plugged in three and we got positive 12. Then we plugged in four, we got negative 16. What's my formula? We're playing, it's like name that tune. We're playing, give that formula. We're playing it backwards. Can you think backwards? What's the formula? What's the, you know, formula for N that you could plug in a 1, you'd get 4. Plug in a 2, you'd get negative 8. Plug in a 3, you'd get 12. Let's think it out for a second. Let's, in fact, how about, the negative is maybe too much to worry about. Let's just pretend they're all positive. We'll do the negative thing in a minute. What if I just said 4, 8, 12, 16? What's the formula that you can plug in into? When you plug in 1, you get 4. Plug in 2, you get 8, etc. What's my formula? 4. 4n? Does 4n work? Let's try it out. Does 4n work? How do we test it? Plug in a 1. What do you get? 4 times 1, 4. Check. Plug in 2. 4 times 2, 8. Check. Plug in 3. 4 times 3, 12. Check. Beautiful. Plug in 4. 4 times 4, 16. Excellent. So 4n is working. Now, good job. Now let's do the minus thing because the second one was minus and the 16 was minus. Right, yeah. So now... We've almost got it. Our answer is 4n, except how do you get that plus minus thing to happen? Why is it the first one's plus, the second's minus, back to plus? It's a toggle switch, isn't it? See what it's doing? It's like a light switch. It's going positive. Oh, there's the whole light. Okay. It's going positive, negative, positive, negative. Right? It's like a light switch going back and forth, back and forth. It's a toggle, we call that in the math science world. It's a toggle. So what, um, what's going to make that happen? Nobody knows. Never seen that before? Something they do a lot in the math science world as you move forward. They, they make signs switch back and forth. It's a minus one. Well, here, let me write it off to the side. What makes sign switch is minus one to the n or minus one to the n plus. That's off the screen. The screen's like small today. It, it varies from day to day. Have you noticed that? It's just weird. All right. So it's either minus 1 to the n or minus 1 to the n plus 1, depending on whether you want it to start negative or start positive. I don't know which is which. I never memorize it. I just figure it out at the time. What I mean is if you put a 1 into this, this will be minus 1 to the 1. It'll be minus. If you put a 2 in, it'll be positive, won't it? So it'll start minus. Whereas this one, if you put in a 1, you'll already be at 2. It'll be positive. It'll start positive, won't it? If you put in a 2 you'll get 3 and it'll be back to negative. See how they start off with opposite signs? Am I going too quick? Are you tracking with me on that? If you take this one and you put in 1, you get negative right, right away. If you take this one and you put in 1, it's n plus 1 power, so it's 2, it's negative 1 squared, it's positive right away. Starts positive. So which one do we want? Do we start positive or start negative? Start positive. So I want negative 1 to the n plus 1. There it is. That's the toggle switch. And that's the whole thing. It's 4n with a toggle switch. 4n with minus 1 to the n plus 1. So you'll see that again in your, if you go keep going to math and science, the toggle switch thing. It's a very common tool. Good. See how we figured that out? We're thinking backwards, aren't we? We're thinking backwards. All right. So now, well, well let, let, me, let me hold on for a second. It, it, this, this is exactly what science does as opposed to math, 
right? Do you know about that? Have you ever given much thought to any of that? What, is, what does science do? Science looks at results, like numbers, and they try to backtrack to a formula, right? Something predicting that behavior, right? So they look at the sky, or they look at, you know, the human body, and they say, hey, we're seeing this, we're seeing that, we're seeing the other thing. What's the rule there? What's making that happen, right? And, and then they come up with all kinds of rules, like acids and bases and chemistry and physics uses different things, you know. Anyway, th this is exactly what science does, right? They look at some results, and they say, what's the formula making that happen? And then they come up with a formula that fits the known data. Does that make sense? That's called, when you do that, that's what exactly what, that, that's the scientific method, basically. That's what science does. It's called inductive logic as opposed to the other kind of logic, which math really is all about, even though this is a math problem, and I'm, we're, te we're technically doing inductive logic, math normally is deductive logic. Deductive logic is when you go from the rule to the results. That's normally what we do in math. Whereas inductive is from the results. Res I need an L in there, huh? Results to the rule, right? We looked at the results. We looked at 4, negative 8, 12, and we said, what's the rule making that happen? We started with the results, and we went back to the rule. That's what science does all the time, right? They look at, you know, how physics looks at how things move and motion in the skies and the weather and our bodies, and, and they go, oh, here's what we're seeing. Here's the results. What's the rule? They go back for the rule. Math normally, most of math, is deductive, meaning you start with the rule, and then you give the results of the rule. Deductive logic is 100% reliable, always. I mean, it's, it's not really a boastful statement or something. It's just the fact of deductive logic. It's because it's always got to be. Because, you know, if this is the case, then that's the case. So, for example, let me give you a simple deductive logic statement. It's so simple, it's, it's embarrassingly simple. If I said, hey, I'm thinking of a number in my head, all right? I am. I'm thinking of a number in my head. It's, the number in my head is bigger than 6. The number that's in my head is bigger than 6. Okay? Then, therefore, by deduction, then it must be bigger than 5. Well, yeah. It's dumb. But, yeah, it's real simple, isn't it? And that can never be false, right? If the number I'm thinking, I was thinking of 7. If the number I'm thinking is bigger than 6, then it's bigger than five. Seems so simple, like, what, what, what's that? That's child's play, right? All of math, really, is that kind of reasoning. Sure fire, huh? See how that's 100% reliable? That'll never be overturned. That's why math is never overturned. We never look back and go, oh, yeah, what they proved in the 1800s, Gauss? No, we found that. No, 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 that never happens. Because all of math is proved deductively. It's all is as sure fire as that. That's all the foundations of math. Where science is usually inductive. It's great. You can do more fancy things with inductive logic, but then it's also never 100% sure. It becomes more and more sure as you see more and more results verified. But, you know, you're never sure because you've never seen everything. You know what I mean? Inductive logic. So technically, if I can, if I can make the one boast that math has over science, if a science teacher says the following line to you, they don't completely understand the nature of the two. If they say, science has proven, whoa, hold on right there. Technically, I mean, I know what he or she means. I know what they mean. But technically, 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 science can't prove beyond 100%, for 100% sure in anything. They can't. They need to say, based on everything we've seen so far, this rule fits the known data. That's what they can say. But they haven't seen everything. And that's the story of how science has gone over the years, right? We, we, we get improved technology and we see further in the sky or further into the cells and our bodies, and then they discover more stuff, huh? You know what I mean? They develop telescopes that see further, electron microscopes that see smaller, and then they go, oh. So it's the same thing as with my little sequence series stuff here. Like, if I told you, hey, I'm thinking of a sequence, all right? It starts with one, and then two, and then four. Okay, what's, what's the next number? What's, well, what's the rule? Let me, what's the rule I'm following there? What am I doing every time? Let's, let's do the science thing. And let me show you what I mean. What's the rule I'm following? Every, everything in your head. Don't say it out loud because you might, you might have more than one answer. Think in your head for a second. What is the rule I'm following? Just look at that pattern. What did I do to one to get two? 
What did I do to two to get four? Think, think in your head for a minute. You're a scientist, you're looking at some results in the sky or in the body or something, and you're saying, huh, we see a one, a two, and a four. So what scientists do, exactly what they do, scientific method. And they go, what's the rule there? What's the governing principle that's making that happen? All right, you ready? Somebody want to tell me, what am I doing to the numbers? Somebody want to volunteer an answer? What am I doing? You got one? Times it by two. Or what? Yeah, times by two or adding itself. You're saying adding something good. That's another way to say the same thing. I like, I like that. Yeah, times by two, times by two, times by two. So the next one would be eight. Anybody have another thing, though, that I was doing? That's Berto. One, two, four. Um, you can keep adding one, two, three. Good. Maybe I was adding one, then adding two. Then I would add three, and this would be seven. How do you know? Both fit the known data. Do you see the problem? See the problem with being 100% sure inside? You never know. So, so like technology improves, we see further or deeper in the cells, and we go, the next piece of data, is it 7 or is it 8? And then we know which theory is right. Maybe it's 6, and there's some other theory that explains even more deeply. Now, I'm not just making it up. That's exactly what's happened, right? Newton, remember Newtonian physics? Remember what Newton, remember what they thought at first? You remember, the, you've seen the old, like, the apple falls out of the tree and hits, first of all, that's Newtonian physics, right? Newton, they make the joke that Newton discovered physics when the apple hit his head, but... That wasn't really it. You know, so they used to think, they used to, before Newton's time, Newton 1800s, 1700s, 1700s, 1600s, 1600s, I think. Anyway, Google it. But uh, Newton, uh, I think 1600s, before his time, they used to think the heavier an object was, the faster Earth pulled it down. Because that's what they saw. They saw like a rock and a feather. And you drop them, and the rock goes zoop straight down, and the feather goes, and they go, oh, because the rock's heavier. Because the rock's heavier. Heavier objects, the earth pulls them faster. That's what it looked like. They didn't have a lot of data back then. Right? Then, technology improved, and they developed a vacuum. I mean, a vacuum, where they, not a vacuum on the floor, right? Vacuum where they suck the air out of the tube. They got a, a tube with no air. And they put the rock and the feather with the gloves into the vacuum, and they let them go, and the rock and the feather went boom! Together, went, oh, look at that. No, the earth was pulling on the rock and the feather to accelerate them the same. It was just the wind resistance was getting in there. The air was holding up the lighter object, but the earth was trying to pull them the same. We didn't realize that. That's called Newtonian physics, right? Newton came up with there's one gravitational force on all objects the same, 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration, right? So that seemed like it was true for a long time. And then Einstein came along, right? And he measured things near the speed of light, way faster than we could ever measure things before, things going super fast. And, you know, I don't want to, this isn't a physics class. I like physics. I want something to go on. And I think it's very interesting. You ever seen those old relativ relativity movies? It's very interesting how things, everything travels, it seems like. And you can see how, I think that's how scientists should talk. It seems like. That's, that's to the best known data we have right now. It seems like. Everything travels relative to the speed of light the same. So in other words, so let me, let me do one more physics thing. I think this is very interesting. What if you're on a train? Okay, you're choo, 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 choo. I'm going to draw some tracks. I'm a really artistic person. Okay, so there's the track. You're on this train, cruising along, all right, and you're up here, and you're going to, and there's somebody down here on the track. Watch out for that train. No, maybe we better put them on the side. All right, whatever. They're over here. They're, they're not on the tracks. It's dumb to play on the tracks. All right, so, and they're going to throw a baseball to this person. The train is going, let's say, 20 miles an hour, and they're going to throw the baseball at 30 miles an hour relative to their hand. They're going to take that baseball, stand it on the train, they're going to release it out of their hand 30 miles an hour. How fast will this person catch? The train's going 20, so the baseball's already being moved along 20 when the person just holds it, because the train's moving 20, right? And then the person throws the baseball out of their hand, 30 out of their hand, 30 relative to their hand, how fast will, when it hits the person who's standing on the ground, still, how fast will it feel like that baseball hit? If we put a, sp a speedometer gun there, how fast will it say that baseball was moving? 50. You add it, right? Because the baseball was already moving 20 because of the train, and then an additional 30 on the throw, it'll hit that glove at 50, right? I could have been a big league pitcher if I could just throw off trains, right? You can, you can really get that ball moving. So, um, 50 miles an hour. So, that seems to be true. And you hear what I'm saying. That seems to be true. It sure seemed like it for hundreds of years. 
a couple hundred years, and then uh, three, maybe 300 years, and then Einstein came along and he said, yeah, but if you go really fast, really fast, like the speed of light, like if you're up there and instead of throwing a baseball, you, uh, you well, you just, you just ride on the train and, and, and you turn on the headlights. What if, what if the train's going at the speed of light? What if the train is cranking down those tracks at the speed of light and then, and, and, and then you turn on the headlights? which obviously light goes out at the speed of light because it's light, right? And so it's going to shine out at the speed of light from an object already moving at the speed of light. Trains already moving at the speed of light. Turn on the headlights. They shine away from the train like the baseball going out of the hand at the speed of light. This person over here will receive the light. How fast? Well, it seems like it's two times the speed of light. Because it's already moving the speed of light, and then you're shining away the speed of light, but it's just going to be the speed of light. One time the speed of light, not two. Why? Because it's weird, and it's complex, and the universe is deep and mysterious. Truly. That's why Einstein's stand for a scientist's imagination is more important than knowledge. A lot of times you just got to try stuff. Turns out everything travels, well, it appears, everything travels relative to the speed of light the same. You can't go faster than the speed of light. But now there's more research with some other complex stuff. I'll end it there. That's plenty. But my point is, it's, it, I, I think it's important to know, as you, if you guys move on to math science, how math works. It serves science. Math is mainly deductive. Science is inductive. And that's how they, that's how they work together. So um, have you ever seen those old movies? Let me do 30 seconds. Those old movies where, I thought it was very fun in physics class, where the person travels, you know, the twins. You ever seen the twin movies? You type into Google or something, the twin uh, relativity. You know, that when Einstein first started proving the best he can prove, or I'm using the word too, proving to the best of known data, what he, his theory of relativity, that everything travels relative to the speed of light, same. Um, he, what he ended up showing is if you, had, if you had twins, and one of, them went, one of the twins went out in a spacecraft and flew around at the speed of light for, for 50 years, and then came back to Earth, you, you wouldn't age as much. Time is actually relative. If you go faster... You age slower. We know that. That's why you've got to move around a lot of exercise. No, I'm kidding. That, it's not that. I'm just joking around. But if you could go near the speed of light. See, that was the problem. Back in the Newtonian days, we couldn't measure anything near the speed of light. We were doing slow poke. So everything looked right by Newtonian physics. All right. I'm going way too much on physics. All right. So back in this section. All right. So um, A1 is negative 4. A n is n minus a sub n minus one. Yeah, let me help with this. What this is basically saying, let me explain how to how to do this. This means a sub n means any term is n minus the previous term. That's that's what you have to understand that thing is saying. That a sub script n minus one. That sub n minus one. That means previous term. That's what that means because it's one back in minus one. So what this formula is, and this is a recursive formula, we call it that, I can't write and spell, speak and spell, recursive, there we go. It's a recursive formula because it calls back, it, it recurs, it goes back to a previous term. That's, you know, reoccurrence, right? It goes back. So any term, what it's saying is you want to know any term? Take the term number you're on and subtract the previous term. That's what it's saying. Want any term? Take the term number you're on and subtract the previous term. Well, what does it mean? Let's try it out. First off, A1, they're asking me for A1. Well, that's just being handed to me on a silver platter. A1 is negative 4. Let's find the second term. So we start off with A1. They're giving me A1. They just gave it to me right here direct. A1 is negative 4. How about A2? sub two? How do we find A2? sub two? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's n minus the previous. Well, that'd be 2. It's whatever term number you're on. 2 minus the previous. What's the previous? Negative 4. So minus a negative 4 actually is plus 4 is 6. Is that good so far? It's always the term number you're on minus the previous term. So the second term is 2 minus the previous term. The third term will be 3 minus the previous. The fourth term will be 4 minus the previous term. It's always the term number you're on minus the previous term. It's a recursive formula. So a sub 3 will be n minus previous, so it'll be 3, the term number you're on, 3, minus the previous. What's the previous? 
6. So you always have to go back to the previous. That's what I mean by recursive. You've got to recur. So negative 3. Making sense? So A4 is n minus the previous. So it will be 4, the term number we're on, minus the previous. What's the previous? Negative 3. So double negative 4 plus 3, 7. And finally, A sub 5 will be 5 minus the previous. 5 minus the previous was 7. Negative 2. We good like that? Recursive formulas are nice. A lot of programming languages now are recursive languages, so you'll learn what that adds. Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm gonna resist. We're not gonna do a whole computer science talk in recursive programming and how that's different than <laughs> other kinds of programming. I don't even remember much of that anyway. Um, but um, notice there is a problem with a recursive formula anyway. Uh, recursive programming is pretty powerful, I've heard. But um, recursive formulas are not as powerful because what if I asked you, for example, for the hundredth term right now? Could you jump down to the hundredth term? No. You can only go one at a time, huh? Because the hundredth term would be 100 minus the previous term. What's the previous term? I don't know. I don't know the 99th term. You see, you see how you can't jump? You can only do one at a time with recursive. All right. So let's go. So A1 is 6. A1 is 6. A n is A n minus 1 over n squared. So go ahead and see if you can find, we already have A1. That's Again, that's handed to us on a silver platter. That's 6. A1 is 6. See if you can find A sub 2. So what's a sub 2? What is this a sub n minus 1? What does that mean? Previous. Yeah. Previous, right? a sub n minus 1 means 1 back. n minus 1, 1 back. So that's going to be previous, whoops, previous term, over the term number squared. So previous term, 6, right, over the term number squared, 2 squared. I'm on term number 2. So the term number squared, 2 squared. 6 fourths, is that 1.5? And then a sub 3. We good so far? Are we happy? Are we going too fast? Go ahead, and, go ahead and find a sub 3. One Carlos. <coughs> Six minus one? For A sub three? Six minus one over two squared? Um, it's going to be the previous term over n squared. So what's the previous term? 1.5? I will tell you they won't accept decimals on that problem. Oh, they won't take decimals? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll make it a fraction. Oh, uh, so so are you saying, I you thinking there's a different answer for a sub 2 than what I got? The problem is a n minus 1 over a squared. Right. So, are, yeah, this minus 1 is not like a minus 1 that's up high. Juan Carlos, there's a difference between this and that. It's not, it's, it's not that. Yeah, so it's a good question. That n minus 1 is low down. It's in the subscript. So that means you don't actually subtract 1. It just means it's the previous term. Does that make sense on that? If you plug it in, it would make sense. I mean, you put a 2 right. minus 1, it's going to be a 2. 
That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Does that make sense? Yeah. That n minus one is in the subscript. In case I'm sure other people are wondering the same thing. I'm glad you brought that up. So it's not. We don't actually subtract one. It means one term back is what the minus one means. It doesn't mean subtract one. Yeah. So they won't take a 1.5, huh? They don't like my decimals. Okay, so three halves. So we'll give three halves. I'll take decimals on the test. I don't care. Um, okay, so then previous term, that'll be three halves over n squared over three squared. Does that make sense? So that'll be three halves over nine, like that. Now, what do we do with that? What do you do when you got fractions over fractions? Yeah, grab the one on the bottom and flip it up. Are you comfortable with that? That's used all the time in calculus. So this is really 9 over 1. You bring it up, and it's 3 halves times 1 over 9. See how it flipped upside down? That's because it really means 3 halves divided by 9 over 1. And then you flip the one on the right and change the times. That's all I'm doing, right? 3 halves over 9 over 1 means 3 halves divided. So you flip it in times. So then that will become what? Uh, 3 over 18, or you could have just cross-canceled. would have been quicker. One sixth. Good on that. I tried doing the decimal. Wouldn't take a decimal. Right? I don't know why it's so opposed to decimals. All right, one sixth. Oh yeah, one sixth would be a decimal that goes forever, so that's probably a problem. So you got a sub three. One try a sub four and a sub five. Oh, what's up? Oh, yeah, that's another way. Good good observation, yeah. Like we have the 3 halves over 9. You could, you could say, look, I'll just uh, multiply by 2, multiply by 2 like that. You're totally right. Cancel 3 18s, reduces 1 6. Same answer. Yeah, that's another good way. Another good way. So try A sub 4. See if you can get A sub 4. So a sub 4 will be previous term. Oops. <laughs> previous term over term number squared. So previous term is 1 6. 1 6 over n squared over 4 squared. So 1 6 over 16. Good to there. So it's always the previous term. That's the a sub n minus 1 over the term number squared. So that's going to be, I'm going to flip that 16 up. 1 6 times one sixteenth, because that's sixteen over one, right? So it flips up to be one sixteenth. That's one one over ninety six. Is that what that is? Sixteen yes. Yeah. So there's a four. One more. A sub five. Previous term over n squared. Previous term is we're getting big now. One over ninety six over n squared five squared. So that's one over ninety six over twenty five. Put it over one. Flip it up. 1 over 96 times 1 over 25. 2,400 straight? Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 1 over, yeah. 1 over 2,400. Those terms are getting small. Is that good on that? Recursive? Just keep going back to the previous term. All right, let's try this. And so they're telling us... They're telling us the first term. They're just handing us the first one on a silver platter, as they always do, capital A. And see if you can find A sub 2. See if that recursive language is, is making some more sense to you. A sub n minus 1 plus 3d. So that a sub n minus 1, again, that's previous term. Previous term plus 3d. So therefore, if I want to find a sub 2, it's going to be the previous term, which would be capital A, huh? The previous term, plus 
3D, and that's just it, huh? Nothing I can really do with that. And then let's go to A sub 3, if you're good with that one. A sub 3, what's it going to be? Previous term plus 3D. Am I going too fast? Am I good? What's the previous term? All of that. So it's going to be all of that. A plus 3D plus the new 3D. So that's A plus 60. We can combine like terms, huh? So that's A sub 3. We just keep adding a 3D every time, huh? We just take the previous term and we add a 3D, don't we? So can I just jump right to it, skip some steps? Just take this and add a 3D. So it's capital A plus 9D, and A sub 5 is capital A, add a 3D, plus 12D. We good? You just always take the previous term and add a 3D. Questions on that one? We good? All right. I think that's... All right, so... All right, so we got the... That's the, um, that's the big Greek S called sigma. So it's just, it's just a Greek S. So, um, and what, what S stands for is sum. Add them up, in other words. So basically what they're telling, when you see that big Greek symbol, it's going to, I think we, have we had it before? I think we might have it before. No? Anyway, we'll use it again a couple times. So, um, well, actually a lot in this chapter will be a lot. So it means, when you look at it, just think S. It's a big, it kind of looks like an S almost. Oh, it's a big Greek S. And what it means, it means take this formula and um, start, start at 1 and plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, plug in 4 for K, and end at N. Normally there's a number up there. This time it's just a letter. But you start at 1, go to whatever, just keep plugging into the formula K plus 6 and add them all up. That's what that's saying. It's saying take this formula K plus 6, plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, plug in 4, add them all up, go all the way to N. So I go, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm going to plug in 1, plug in 2. Okay, that's supposed to be K. Try that again. Plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, dot, 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 and the last one will be N. All right, so plug in 1 to the formula k plus 6, right? That's the formula. So that would be 1 plus 6 or 7. Plug in 2 to the formula k plus 6. 2 plus 6, 8. Plug in 3 to the formula k plus 6. 3 plus 6, 9. And add them up all the way to the last one, k plus 6. Plug in n. Plug in n n plus 6. So there we go. What do they want? They want the first term, the second term, and it looks like dot, 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 last term, n plus 6. That's all they want, first, second, and last, from us. Make sense how I worked with that formula? They're just making sure you understand what that, what that symbolism is saying. It's saying, add them up, sum them up. It's a Greek S. That formula, as you go from... Start at k equals 1, all the way to n, plugging into that formula. Add them up, sum them. Questions on that one? We good? Okay, so the sum. k equals 0 to n of 1 over 9 to the k. All right, so try it out. They want, looks like they want the first three terms and the last term from us. Where do we start on this one? What's the, are we going to plug in one to start on this one? Yeah, zero, huh? This one starts at zero. They can start anywhere they want. They can end anywhere they want. So they're starting at zero. So first plug in zero. Then one, then two
Okay, how y'all doing? Just working out. So plug in 0 to the formula 1 over 9 to the k. So that'd be 1 over 9. So what's anything to 0 power? 1. So 1 over 1 is just 1. Plug in 1 to the 1 over 9 to the k. That's 1 over 9 to the 1 or just 1 ninth, huh? Plug in 2 to 1 over 9 to the k. It's 1 over 9 squared. 1 over 81. Is that good? And lastly, plug in n to 1 over 9 to the k, 1 over 9 to the n. There they are, first, second, third, and last terms. Questions I can answer on that one? Good. All right, so we're taking... We're going the sum from k equals 8. This time we're starting at 8, notice. Of minus 1 to the k natural log k. All right, so start at, start at 8. They want first, second, third, and the last. And I think you just leave it natural log. Yeah, that's the exact answer. So they don't want a decimal. So, yeah. So start with 8. It'll be what? Minus 1 to the 8th, natural log 8, huh? Now, what's minus 1 to the 8th? That's just positive, right? If there's an even power, it's just positive, huh? So that's just natural log 8, huh? And they just want you to leave it that way. Next, we plug in 9. Minus 1 to the 9, natural log 9. Isn't that going to be just minus natural log 9? Because the minus 1 to the 9th power comes out negative. Like that. Do the next one. Plug in 10. So you'll get positive natural log 10. Am I going too quick? Is this making sense? So I started at 8, plugged in 8, plugged in 9, plugged in 10. And lastly, plug in n. And you get minus 1 to the n. Natural log in, and, and that's it. You can't really do anything more than that. That is the last term. Good. How are we doing? You guys are always such a quiet group. Questions? I can answer. Is it all making sense? All right, feel free to stop. All right, so they're, yeah, they're basically kind of like that. You know, they're giving us some results, almost like the science thing. You know, they're giving us the results. They want us to go back and say, hey, which one of these formulas produces that? Which one of those formulas makes those numbers happen? Can you tell? I'll give you a second just to look at the multiple choice options there. Second. So try them out if you're not sure. A's got a small problem. At the end. Look at the how A finishes. A go, starts at one, goes to seven, right? Right, start, end. So it starts great. Plug in one, four fifths. Beautiful, that's my first term. Right? But where does it end? N is seven, or K, I guess it's K. K is seven, whatever you want to call it. Just plug in a seven. Three plus seven over four plus seven, that'd be ten elevenths. Is that where it ends? No. Not quite, huh? So what's the answer, really? D. Is it D? I don't think it's D, because if you put in 1 here, aren't you going to get 5, 6 for your first term when you start at 1? Well, now see how that would give you 5, 6? Do you see how that works? You're supposed to start with whatever number they have. But if I put in a 1, I'm going to get 5, 6. That's not where my series starts. It doesn't start with 5, 6. It starts with 4 fifths. So the answer is C, really, isn't it? Everybody see that? Because if you put in 1, it starts at, that'll be 4 fifths, huh? And it goes all the way to 8. When you put in 8, you'll get 11 twelfths, which is where it ends, huh? Right? You want to end at 8, 
start at 1. Does that make sense? We good there? Yeah, when they give you the N formula at the end, that's pretty much the answer. Yeah, these are nice. These will be, you want a lot of these on the test. That's basically the answer, you know, except make it a K instead of an N because we're using K down here, you know. So it's 6 to the K over K. I mean, that is it. They're telling you the formula there. Hey, and then where are we supposed to stop? N, because that's the last one they plugged in N. Right, it was K. This is a K thing. And the last one they plugged in an N, and they got that. There it is. You know, whoops, it's off the screen now. There it is. Yeah, so that one's a gimme. Whatever, we'll do whatever one pops up here. Yeah, 17. Um, did I skip 16? I don't know, whatever. Let's try it. Um, this one's a trick because there's nothing to plug in. So remember, you're supposed to start down here, end up here, plug in, but, but like there's, there's nothing to plug in. There's no plug-in slot, so it's just going to be 5 every time. You know what I mean? So K is 1, plug in 1, but you throw away the 1. There's nowhere to plug it in. First term is 5. Plug in 2, nowhere to plug it in. It's another 5. Plug in 3, nowhere to plug it in. It's another 5. All the way to the end, plug in 14. There's nowhere to plug it in. It's just a 5, and that's a Greek S, right? It means sum, add them up. So it's just a bunch of fives added up. Does that make sense? Because the formula doesn't even have a K at all. It's just five. So you're just going to add up five 14 times, huh? Does that make sense? You're, you're, going, you're starting at one, going to 14, adding up five every time. So it's five times 14, isn't it? 50, 70? So it's just 70. Does that make sense? Like a trick question there? There's nothing to plug in? Good? All right. All right, so here we go. So they give me a formula on this one. Uh, 4n minus 3. That's my formula. And basically what they want me to do is start finding some terms. Can we do that like we, like we did it before? Let's, let's plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, plug in 4, plug in 5. Let's crank out some terms from the formula 4n minus 3. It says find the common difference and write out the first four terms. Well, so we don't have to do the fifth term. Just the first four, I guess. All right, so crank out those first four terms. And you plug in one. Four times one minus three, what's that? One. Plug in two. Is that eight minus three, five? Plug in 3, 12 minus 3, 9. Plug in 4, 16 minus 3, 13. Now, we're not adding these ones up. No, notice we don't have a big Greek S anywhere, right? It's not a sum. There's no Greek S. We're not adding them up. We're just finding them. 1, 5, 9, 13. There's the first four terms. They also do ask us for the common difference. What's the difference? What's the jump from term to term? What's it going up by every time? Yeah, it's adding 4. That's called the difference or the jump from term to term. So the common difference is 4. That's the first answer they're asking you for. And then they ask you for the four terms. We just found them, 1, 5, 9, 13. Good on that? That's called an arithmetic sequence. Notice at the top, arithmetic, meaning you jump from term to term by adding or subtracting arithmetic the same number every time. When you add or subtract the same number every time from term to term, that's called an arithmetic sequence. After the break, we'll come back and we'll do some geometric sequences, which means you multiply the same number from term to term every time, or divide. All right, try that one. So 2 minus 8 in. Same kind of thing, just crank out the first four terms, and then see if you can see the common difference. Plug in 
So plug in one, plug in two, plug in three, plug in four. So two minus eight times one, what's that? Minus six. Two minus eight times two, minus fourteen. Two minus eight times three, minus twenty-two. Two minus eight times four, minus thirty. Getting those four? And what's the common difference? Yeah, from term to term, it's going down by eight every time, isn't it? Yeah, right. Do you see the rule? How can, we, how can we find the common difference without doing anything? Look at the formula. Where's the common difference? Yeah, it's like the slope. Do you see how that's like mx plus b? It's just backwards. It's b plus mx, right? And there's, that's the slope. It's exactly like that. The difference, that's what happens with the slope, right? It's the, you know, every time you go over one, it's the jump amount, right? That's exactly what these formulas are. They're like a little slope formula. And the slope is the common difference. Hey, Mr. Roberto. So common difference is the slope. Yeah, so you can just do that. You still have to find the four terms because they're going to ask for them, but good observation. Exactly. Remember the last one? Let's look back. The last one, see, the, the four was the slope was the difference, huh? So that will always be it. Yeah, good. I was hoping you'd all see that. All right. All right. Try that one. That one is a little more tricky. So uh, give it a go. Go ahead and plug in. N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3, N equals 4. Get the first four terms, and then see if you can find the difference. This is tricky. I'll be impressed if you can nail it. So ln of 2 to the 1, that's just ln 2. And that's n equals first term, second term, third term, fourth term, second term, ln 2, 2, ln 4, ln 2 to the third, ln of 8, ln of 2 to the 4th, ln of 16. So there's the first four terms. But what's the common difference? It's a tricky one. It's a little tricky down here to see it. Have you got an idea? In other words, what is it adding every time? What do you got to add to ln2 to get ln4? You're, in fact, we're adding the same number every time it turns out. What, what are we adding every time? What's that? It looks, like we're, it looks like we're just doubling the number, huh? But how is that adding the same thing every time? How could doubling that number be adding. Sounds like I'm saying two different things with my mouth, right? Sounds like I'm saying, on the one hand, you're looking at it going, well, we're doubling the number. I can tell we're doubling the number, right? But you're telling me we're adding the same number every time? I am. What do you mean adding? It's, it's, it's timesing by two, by two, by just not adding. No, I'm sorry. I know that little number in the natural log is doubling. That, that is clearly true. But overall, that's happening because we're adding the same number. How so? How can we see that? It just sounds like I'm making up lies. How could that be true? It's doubling. It's not adding. Well, you know what we need to do is remember the properties. What is, um, what is another way? This is true, but what's another? What do we learn about powers? What can you do with the power? You can uh, move to the front. To the front. To the front. So instead, we could write it this way. It's okay. It's right either way. But this way, we'll be able to see it. Bring it down. Right? So you could rewrite them that way. Okay, great. So what? Well, what do you got to add to ln2 to make it 2 ln2? An ln2. What do you got to add to 2 ln2 to make it 3 ln2? Another ln2. What do you got to add to 3 ln2 to make it 4? See, they're just adding an ln2 every time. They really are. I wasn't making it up. They're just adding an ln2 every time. They're just adding another ln2. Ln2 is the common difference. 
What about our little tricky rule that we looked at a minute ago? And I said it's like, you know, like a slope, and you can just see it right on the first step. Could we have, could we have somehow seen on the first step that the common difference was going to be ln2? Where did we find it? Let's go back. Look back here. Where did I find the common difference? The number multiplied next to the n. How about here? The number multiplied next to the n. Let's go forward. What's the number multiplied? We don't have a number. We have 2 to the n power. That's not number multiplied next to n. Do the same thing. Now what number is multiplied next to the n? ln2. See the beautiful agreement? It's true. That's the slope. That's the common difference. They want decimals on this one? Oh, they do. Three decimal places. Oh, so they would probably not do any of this. They would just do decimals and you would just subtract them. They wrecked the problem by doing decimals. Anyway. Whatever. We did it the better way. And we'll stop. All right, so A1, so first term is 2, D is 5. Let me give you a formula. A sub n is A1, whoops. A sub n is A1 plus n minus 1D. I'm going to give you that at the top of exam number 4. You don't even have to put it on your 3x5 card. I'll hand it to you at the top along with a bunch of other formulas. That would be one of the many formulas you'll have at the top, you know, about five, maybe six or seven, formulas at the top of the next exam. A1, An is A1 plus N minus 1D. All right. What does that, how does that work? Well, that's what we use to find the formulas and the problems pretty much from this point forward. So, okay, so A1, they're telling me, is 2. D, they're telling me, is 5. So let's put that in. A1 is 2. D is 5. Let's distribute that 5 and gather like terms. So minus 3 plus 5n. And there we go. Oh, no, they're going to ask us. They're going to say find the 44th term also. I'll do that also in a second. But... Are you good to there? Is that making sense what it is? So I, I, haven't, I haven't told you where that formula comes from, which we'll talk about after the break. But for now, we'll use it like it's magic. So this is the magic formula we're going to use for all those. Just plugged in A1, plugged in D, gathered like terms. Good so far? Um, no. Not that I know of. Probably does. I don't know it. I just call it the A sub N formula. It's not a very exciting name. All right, a sub n equals minus 3. So what that formula can do now is now we can find any term we want. Remember I said a minute ago with the recursive formula you couldn't go to the 100th term? With this, we can. Right? You could, I could say, what's the 100th term? You could plug in 100 for n and you could bang. And, but they're going to ask us for the 44th. So let's find the n equals 44th term. Now this, this is going to produce a bunch of numbers, right? And we could jump anywhere in the list we want all the way down to the 44th term. Just plug in 44 for n. That makes sense? It's at 220. What's that? Did I do something bad? It was. Oh, it was, it was 2, but after, no, it's good though. After gathering my terms, I, it came out with the negative 3 plus 5 n. Yeah, yeah, you just, once, once you got this form, you don't have to go back. Yeah, thanks. Just, just go ahead and use, use it that way. Makes sense? I'm just plugging into to this formula right here. Everybody good with that? <laughs> minus 3 plus 5 in there. So 217 must be the 44th term. So that formula can get you any term. Any term at all in the list. Let's try All right, try that one. So same formula, you're going to write a n is a1 plus n minus 1 d. We'll just keep using that magic formula, having no idea from where it came until after the break. What are you guys going to do without any math to do over the break? Uh, oh, I guess you got 12 1. I guess 12 1, huh? Oh, what, 11 6. 11 6 and 12 1. Was that your biggest worry about the break? What am I going to do?
break. All right, so um, a sub n is a 1, 6, plus n minus 1, d, d is minus 4, distribute, 6 minus 4, n plus 4, is that 10 minus 4, n? So there's the formula, that's the first answer they want, the formula. Now use that formula to find the, what, 44th term? Why are they always asking for the 44th term? Same thing they did. Usually they mix that up. Anyway, so they want the 44th. So plug in for N, 44 in both slots. Make sense? I could have probably shouldn't have messed it all up. Oops, what was it? It was 10 minus 4 in? Yeah, so 10 minus 4 in. That's our formula. We use it here, and we get 10 minus 160, 176, so minus 166. There it is. All right, to be continued after Easter break. Have a good spring break.